In discussing the history of the United States since 1877, we have to begin with a discussion of how the Gilded Age played out in three distinct areas of the country. The Gilded Age proper it, it refers specifically to uh, the rapid industrialization of uh, what we now call the Rust Belt of the Upper Midwest and the Northeast. But we also want to discuss um, the history of the Trans-Mississippi or Frontier West. And in this lecture and a couple that will follow, we will talk about the post-bellum, that is the uh, after Civil War South. The first of these lectures about the South then is the one before you now, in which we will discuss uh, over the next few minutes, the New South Creed. That is the way what you might call progressive Southerners uh, thought about how the South should recover from the Civil War. Let's look first at um, a reminder of geography. When we talk about the South, we're talking about the former Confederacy. That Confederacy, of course, stretched from Virginia through the Carolinas into the deep South states of Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, into the trans-Mississippi southern states of Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas. These were the states that, uh, in, in addition to, to Tennessee, that seceded from um, the Union in 1860 and 61, fought the Civil War um, uh, as a secession action, were, were defeated in 1865, and were reincorporated into the Union first by presidential reconstruction, and then after 1867 by congressional or radical uh, reconstruction. Reconstruction, as you know, ended in 1877 with the compromise uh, between Rutherford B. Hayes um, in the House of Representatives in order to uh, uh, gain the presidency after the election was thrown into the House. Um, uh, the, the Republican candidate uh, Hayes made a compromise with the South to gain uh, Southern support for his presidency. He said that he would immediately withdraw federal troops uh, from the South and that Reconstruction would be over. Uh, he did that. But that had very little to do with the New South except as a way to um, uh, historically demark the, the end of the Civil War and the beginning of a new phase in Southern and um, uh, in United States history. Let's talk a little about the New South Creed, this idea that, that there was a different direction. Let's look at the people who promulgated the New South Creed, and then in a minute we'll talk about uh, what their ideas were. The great exponents of the New South Creed um, were primarily journalists, people like Daniel Tompkins of North Carolina, uh, Walter Hines Page of North Carolina, Richard Edmonds of the Baltimore um, uh, Merchants Record. But the two great exponents, the two people that history books keep coming back to when they talk about the New South Creed uh, and the whole concept of the New South are William D. Pig Iron Kelly of Pittsburgh, an industrialist and a former radical Republican and abolitionist, and Henry Grady, himself a journalist who was the managing editor of the Atlanta Constitution and who died, as you can see here, in 1889 at the relatively young age of 49. Now, Pig Iron Kelly had a vision of the South after the Civil War that placed the blame for the destruction of the Southern economy not 
so much on the Civil War or on emancipation, which uh, withdrew $4 billion worth of wealth in the form of humans, uh, slaves that is, immediately out of the Southern economy. Uh, but he didn't blame the Civil War and emancipation. He blamed the presence of slavery as a deterrent to modernization of the pre-Civil War Southern economy um, that left that Southern economy um, uh, 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 very vulnerable, you might say, to a single shock. And that single shock was the loss of the Civil War and, and immediate emancipation of slaves. Um, Kelly spent a lot of time berating uh, the antebellum Southern arrangement, you might say, um, and he won the enmity of many Southerners. Many times his life was threatened uh, by Southern sympathizers or by Southerners themselves because he had no um, problem with traveling to the South to say this stuff. Yet with the other hand, he offered um, a, a vision of a way out, and that was to abandon plantation uh, economics, to quit fretting over the loss of slaves, and to develop the industrial resources of places like North Alabama. In fact, uh, Kelly put his effort where his mouth was and spent a great deal of time promoting Anniston, Birmingham, and other iron areas of North Alabama, Southern Tennessee, uh, North Georgia, uh, in an effort to draw investment uh, to that area. Uh, uh, he wanted to develop that area like the area around Pittsburgh had been developed, and eventually this came to pass as both Kelly and people like Kelly, but were, who were mostly Southerners, but with the same vision as Kelly, uh, developed the Birmingham to Chattanooga um, area as an iron and steel manufacturing and um, uh, a product uh, iron man, uh, product manufacturing area. Henry Grady believed in these things also. As uh, historian Dewey Grantham said, Grady's idea was for Southern regeneration, racial harmony, and sectional reconciliation. Uh, Grady was the son of a merchant. Like I said, he went on to become a journalist, uh, the managing editor of the Atlanta Constitution, and he was also, like Pig Iron Kelly, an orator. His most famous speech was one made in 1886, just prior to his death in 1889, before a group of industrialists and financiers in New England. The speech uh, laid out the tenets of um, the New South Creed, and it solidified in one fell swoop what the New South Creed was as it had developed over the previous 10 or 15 years. So it was a verbalization of these ideas that had been current, but had been only articulated in bits and pieces. Um, this was a speech that later generations of uh, Southern school children, at least, were required to commit to memory. You, however, will not be required to commit his speech to memory. What, what did he talk about? What did Pig Iron Kelly talk about? What were these tenets of the New South Creed? Well, the first was a critique of the Old South in order to contrast with what they wanted the New South to become. The critique was that the Old South was based on slavery. It was based on single crop agriculture having to do with cotton. And it was based on a planter elite controlling the levers of government um, as if it was a democracy, but without any real democracy. And uh, consequently, it was the planters, they said, who took the southern states uh, into secession and into the Civil War, as well as crushing the uh, desire of the people to improve um, uh, the economy and to develop 
uh, industry. Now, now this is this is not true. This is what they said, but this is not what we now know um, uh, really occurred. This this is an example of myth making. Some of the uh, uh, the tenets of the New South Creed also said that the New South was based on um, uh, industry as opposed to agriculture. It was based on free labor, wage labor, as opposed to slavery. Uh, that the it, rather than the planters and the plantation being the backbone of the body politic and of the economy, uh, that would be the Jeffersonian ideal yeoman farmer, a small holder who uh, not only subsisted on his and his family's output, but also had enough to enter the marketplace, but only as a small merchant in the marketplace. He traded small amounts of goods for cash that um, this industry and wage labor and yeoman farming would yield a true democracy. But how true was this democracy? How widespread was it? Well, it was based still on white supremacy. And that would be the basis of uh, the reconciliation that the South sought with the North, was white supremacy. Uh, uh, African Americans would not be um, uh, part of the body politic. Uh, women would not be part of the body politic, except as uh, white women, except as um, extensions of their husbands. Uh, and in fact, this would be a male-dominated um, uh, 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 democracy. So you judge for yourself how how far spread their call for democracy was. The only difference in their democracy and the, the, the democracy um, body politic prior to the Civil War was which class would be dominant. Um, and the New South Creed folks called for the dominance of wage workers and yeoman farmers. Uh, what was the impact of this New South Creed, well, it, it didn't go as far as um, the New Southers wanted it to. It didn't live up to its reputation or what they had called for. Uh, however, there was an expansion in boosterism. There was an expansion in, in urbanism. We see the development of lots of cities based on um, um, industry uh, come along. A lot of these cities failed but many more of them succeeded. There was an optimism about uh, the opulence of native resources. In fact, that's one of the things that, um, that Pig Iron Kelly really pushed forward was this idea that the South would be the new quote unquote El Dorado, the place where you could make your fortune because it was so opulent, uh, waiting to be exploited, the natural resources were. Um, like I said, there were many attempts to establish towns based on natural resources. Uh, there were many legislative schemes uh, to attract capital investments. And in fact, there was a concerted effort on the part of many southern state legislatures to attract northern capital uh, to drive industrial development, uh, to manufacture uh, excuse me, to finance manufacturing, and this, it was seen, would uplift all living standards. This is the end of uh, our discussion of the New South Creed. Thank you very much.